hit go. Uh, 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 let's wait for a couple people to show up. Basically, a, a gentleman emailed me and saying that they were they had moved a bunch of their workflow up into Azure into a VM. Mm -hmm. So it was a classic lift and ship situation, lift and shift situation. Mm -hmm. And then um, they ended up with like a Windows Server 2020 whatever uh, VM. But basically, they, they made a VM in the cloud that looked like the one under so-and-so's desk. And now they were tr asking me if I could help them set up IIS. And it's like, well, you know, that's kind of not the way to use the cloud. So, I, I have this conversation all the time. With so I'm writing the blog post on like They made a 100 or $200 VM in the cloud. Uh -huh. And now they're messing around with like administrivia, which is mm -hmm. getting VS to get publishing set up. And it's hassle. They're not doing cloud right. <laughs> right. So I'm suggesting in this blog post, and I don't know how it'll end. Uh, I'm, I'm writing this blog post, and I'm suggesting um, doing an app service plan. Mm -hmm. And then doing a, a SQL Azure. The thing about SQL Azure is you can scale it to like five bucks to like yeah. a, like your your yearly salary. And so um, I, I think yeah. I I've had this conversation so many times. Companies, individual people, all kinds of stuff. And the in the um, I think that people do that because they want control and they feel like if they use a VM, they've got total control and they feel safe with it, right? Because right. But I don't want total control. I want to borrow a dog. Take right. it to the park, look like I own a dog, and then give the dog back, right? Well, and and I think the the thing people don't like capitalize on is like when you deploy to an app service plan, it's basically IIS in the cloud for you. Exactly. Like, yeah, I want not, SQL Server in the cloud and IIS in the cloud, not a VM in the cloud. Yeah, I don't want a VM in the cloud, and I don't want some weird quirky thing that I don't understand in the cloud that I can't move around. Like I could take my site that's running on app service, I could download it and put it on an IIS box. You know, with minimal or no change, right? Yep. I mean, that's, and I, I think that's the thing. It's like, look, you're not giving a, you're not giving up control. You're not having some kind of weird Azure only kind of install thing. You're just not dealing with installing IIS and all that. Exactly. Yep. All right, <clears throat> I think enough people are here. So what we're talking about, as we started uh, in the middle of a sentence, uh, friends, this is ASP.NET Community Stand Up. Damien's on his way. I am in the middle of writing a blog post. Uh, it's not not part of my job. It's just I had a break for a second, and I uh, felt and I got an email from someone uh, saying that they were making an Azure VM to get IIS working, and they were basically they made a VM in the cloud. They tried to remote into it and set up IIS, and they wanted to know how to set up IIS. I used to be an expert at that. I used to know everything about web deploy, so I could make it so you could set up IIS. You can right click and and publish. I don't know how to do that anymore. I have literally overwritten those brain cells with letting Azure do it for me. So to John's point, it's IIS in the cloud. IIS as a service is how I like to think of it. Um, so I'm writing a quick blog post on that. So I'm gonna finish that. Uh, and while I'm doing that, John is going to show us, I'm gonna go ahead and click on you and you're gonna share your screen. John's gonna show us I the sure community am. links for the day. Yep. I'm gonna mute myself though, so you don't hear me tappity tappity. And your screen's sharing a little bit there we go. Just be aware that there's quite a lag there for some reason. So just okay. uh, be All right. So tons of good ones. I think we missed missed a week, and there's tons of good stuff out there. I actually narrowed stuff down a good amount this week. Um, so starting with uh, Scott Allen, he's got a cool, um, you know, just a good to know thing on uh, middleware components as singleton. So the idea is that he has seen people try and do things like save state in a component, save the HTTP context, not realizing that that is gonna be shared among, among other components that are processing multiple requests. So, you know, just a nice quick thing where he talks about how you can, how you can do this better and kind of to the point understanding that it is, you know, shared among others. Rick Straw with a very cool post on running or .NET Core apps on Windows subsystem for Linux, so Bash on Windows, and this is this is really useful. Of course, you know, I you can use Docker. You can do you know you can if you want to run Linux based .NET Core on on Windows, that's an option. He goes through and shows how to do this using using Bash and kind of you know like I've seen people do the same sort of thing with with a Mac, you know, because you have a, a Unixy kind of system. He shows that you can go through and do the same thing points out some gotcha, shows .NET new, and he ends up with running ASP.NET. 
and running his ASP.NET um, sample application, you know, under Windows subsystem for Linux. So very, very cool post there. Jeremy Miller, uh, he's talking about using Storyteller for ASP.NET Core systems. So I, I pointed out his stuff before on um, Storyteller release previously. Um, here he shows, he's been doing this series on how they're using ASP.NET Core in, in his, you know, at his company and, and the work that they're doing with that. Uh, so here he shows some things about how to go ahead and set it up, you know, how you're, how are you using Storyteller? And then this is a nice, a nice feature of Storyteller is that you have these, um, that you can write specifications that are actually human readable, um, and you can get a nice display from them as well. So he's he goes, actually on my list. Uh, we were going to do a podcast, and then uh, we had to cancel. But he's on the list to get a uh, to come on the show. So we'll have him on the show to talk about Storyteller soon too. And and I'm editing a podcast we did with him on the Herding Code as well. So you're gonna you'll hear your fill of Jeremy Miller. Great stuff. He's he's very well spoken and has done a ton of good stuff um, in the community for a while. So. Uh, here is App Metrics. Met App Metrics is an open source, a free open source um, cross platform .NET library for recording metrics for your application. Um, so you know there are several different ones out there. I really like this. Uh, their um, documentation is really nice. They're using DocFX to generate documentation. So you know it goes through and explains some things like um, you know how to configure it and capture metrics and some nice things as far as like in your web monitoring some some nice integration with things like um, visualization so you can uh, you know understand and capture metrics as your app is running very very important as you're you know understanding how your app is performing to gather metrics uh, and and uh, so this is a nice nice library for doing that okay Cecil Phillip uh, I previously talked about something he showed uh, using console for client-side service discovery console is a um, system from HashiCorp, they also make Vagrant. Um, so it, they do things that we, uh, Cecil showed before, service discovery. There's also failure detection and, and some other services available from console. So in this post, uh, Cecil shows how to set up uh, to check service health and implement health checks for your application. So it shows the, the code required in order to set that up and get your health checks. And then you end up with a nice, you know, here's kind of a dashboard that you get to see your health check status. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Hisham showing cache dependency in ASP.NET Core. So uh, cache dependency, you know, caching, you can get a, a lot of performance benefits from implementing a good uh, data cache in your application. However, you need to keep your cache up to date as things change. Um, so Hisham's done, uh, Hisham looked and showed, you know, look, I can have cache invalidation set up on memory cache, but not for my other cache types. And so he shows how you can set up a file-based cache dependency so that your cache will be invalidated when files change and your cache will be updated automatically. So you get the benefits of caching, um, and, but your, your data is kept up to date when needed. This is cool from Andrew Locke. Uh, he's showing how to use Image Sharp for resizing ASP, uh, images in ASP.NET Core. So he actually shows cropping and resizing. And he compares it against code in corecompat.system.drawing. So corecompat.system.drawing is designed to look like the classic system.drawing interfaces. Um, and image sharp is is kind of a new rethought image processing api so he goes through and explains you know here's how you do it in one versus the other and he does do some things where he says like uh look if i am doing um for instance if i'm cropping and resizing this is what it looks like with system dot drawing drawing uh api whereas if i do that in image sharp it's you know fewer lines of code and, and more readable. So he explains, you know, why he's preferring image sharp and, and nice example code on how to use it. Hey, John. Yeah. I think our boss just showed up. Wow. There he is. I don't appreciate that Damien has actually snuck our boss in. <laughs> we were doing really well. I snuck him in. Uh, yeah. He can't hear you, but. He oh, good. oh, he's great. Tell him that. Tell him that he's great, Damien. They're saying yeah. that you're great, Scott. Top notch. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I don't trust him. <laughs> All right. Is he going to listen in, Damien, or what's the plan? 
He can't hear unless he has headphones. So if he's got headphones, we can plug him in. Can you, you can. We did that with Diego. We yeah. plugged an extra set of headphones in. Yeah, plug in the second pair of headphones. Go tell him to get an iPhone headphones and plug him in. I don't. Doesn't. Let me see if I can find some headphones. That worked right. out great with Diego's when we did that. Right, oh, I got three on. more links. I'll stall. You would think so. <laughs> okay, so Chad, uh, Chad has this deploying ASP.NET Core site, and he's got a five-part series on hooking up continuous integration. So he explains why you'd want to use continuous integration in the first one, explains mm -hmm. benefits. Um, and then he shows how to hook it up using Team City um, and you know, explaining the different setup steps. And he also has two, two parts on Octopus Deploy. And then he finishes up with a why stop now and goes into some further things you can set up, uh, things like front end build automation. So really cool in-depth series from, um, from Chad. All right, uh, so Mohammed Rahan Sahid uh, has updated his uh, ASP.NET Core uh, API boilerplate, MVC 6 haha, <laughs> API boilerplate, and here he's showing uh, that he's added in support for versioning. So this is using the ASP.NET versioning system, and he's integrated that in. So this boilerplate, you know, we've mentioned it over and over on this. It's, it's a really good kind of, if you want something that's already pre-baked with a lot of best practices and a lot of nice... Done, uh, done. Yeah. What's yes. the ASP.NET versioning system? Well, also, what is MVC 6? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I did well, throw also, in a chuckle. To, to be clear, though, of course, his boilerplate stuff is fantastic because it works yes. for core. It works for yeah. older versions of MVC. I just wondered when John said it uses the ASP.NET versioning system. I don't know what he's referring to. So let's go to Twitter. That's, uh, preview 3. Uh, no, I hope not. I hope he's not using that part of that <laughs> but, Yeah, what did you mean by that? <laughs> I meant that I quoted what he said on his thing. Let's, we don't let's we don't that. ship any API versioning stuff out of the box. It's something we're looking at for future stuff for the web API stuff. Are you talking I about know. how he uses Swagger and he uses kind of like the the way that one would version things with a URL versioning? Is that what you're API versioning? I we have that is not us. We don't do anything. Yeah. So I don't know. It is us because it's in the Microsoft. Oh, no, I remember. No, no, no. I mean, let's, let's talk. Let's be real. Uh, right? Like point, there's yeah. us okay. and after 110,000 people, and there's us, the 25 click, people. Click who on the ASP. commits. Click on the commits, John. That is not yeah. ASP.NET. We we like what this guy has done. I believe he works I in think Azure. He's a DX for click on comments. Or DX. Yeah. And we have I looked at this stuff, this and we, we, we hope to incorporate yeah. something like this into ASP.NET in the future. We've been talking about this for years. Yeah. But we've he does this more. Done. I know this yeah. guy. I did a blog post about this guy. This is good stuff, but to be yes. clear, it is prescriptive, and it is opinionated, to his credit, how to do versioning within Web API. Now, that said, if you go and look at my blog post on the subject, Chris is a great guy, very knowledgeable. There's a, it's a religious argument around how to do versioning. So this is Chris's perspective, just certain Hanselman versioning Web API. And it is not supported by Microsoft. It's not supported by the ASP.NET team. I think it's, it's worth pointing out that it probably shouldn't be in the Microsoft like, yeah. org. There it is, that one there. Okay. So I talk about it. but yeah, um, So to be clear, the team does want to do this. I imagine in the release after 2.0, like 2.1 or something. We this yeah. might be one of the things we take on. It's not. It's not simple. Like to do it well. Um, yeah. It's kind of I like work. It. But I we'd think like it's to cool, do. It. But it's opinionated, and I kudos to Chris for doing it. But it Absolutely. is a little bit unclear where it comes from. Yep. Okay. Cool. cool. All right. Good deal. Thanks. All right. One more. Uh, this one's a great post. This is um, from Alexand uh, Alexander, uh, and uh, here he shows a lot of steps that he went through in terms of filtering bot traffic by user agent. So this is something that his company is doing and with advertising and they need to not serve ads to bots. Um, I think this is the this is the article that's been flying around Twitter the last couple of days. This right? article yeah. was Hacker news. amazing, yeah. Yeah. extremely dense and hard to read. And it There's also lot assumes there. it also assumes that you know everything all the way down to the metal. And by the metal, if you I want mean, to do this type of work, you kind of have to. Be. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I mean the real metal. Like you need to remember yeah. what a CPU register is and why it's yep. important. Well, case in point, he actually has like a part where he is going into the CPU, like caching and and all that right. kind of stuff. And this yep. is really interesting. I'm actually spending a lot of time right now debugging a Node application. And uh, you know, the, there's two flavors of metal, right? There's the metal of the JavaScript, and then mm -hmm. there's the metal of the computer itself. And a lot yeah. of people do no debugging, and down to the point where it's like, oh, I hit V8, that's as far as I can go. Yeah. Uh, and then other people hit the actual metal. And he went into the Intel VTune, um, yep. which mm -hmm. has been around a long time, by the way. It's a and really it costs powerful, very money, mature tool. I believe they have to pay yeah. for it, right? So I think where where most people will stop would be like Benchmark.net or ILSpy. 
Yeah, it yeah, is, so it's interesting that he does point out these different tools that are available. Definitely benchmark.net is one to know. And then uh, there's the overall process of I kept measuring, then I found this was the, the you know, what was blocking, then I found this. There was another one I was trying to find in here where he goes through, um, there's a simple thing where he just did, instead of doing a ternary, he switches it to a try get value, mm -hmm. you know, save something. So, I mean, it's true. There is some in-depth, deep stuff that he's doing, but there's also some just kind of, hey, here's some smart optimization things. So Yeah, and absolutely. He, yeah. So. Is it, I mean, this is stuff that the folks on the ASP.NET Core team and uh, certain folks in the .NET team do a lot in terms of tuning a bunch of APIs and tuning a bunch of code that we use in our high-performance code paths, like in Kestrel and in the APIs that we call mm -hmm. from Kestrel. And they literally get down to, oh, if I don't have this field in this method, I can optimize the register uh, like assignments and access. Instead of it going into a register, it might get hoisted onto like a memory access, and that's so much slower. Da -da 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 -da. So mm -hmm. you can get all that stuff <laughs> using like the perf right. tools that exist today. Um, but it, it's a learning curve. Like you can't just like run an analyzer and it'll tell you fix these fourteen things. Like right. you, you, you dive and, and you learn. It's, and it's very different perspective and very different mm -hmm. skill set. If you are right now watching the show and you're doing text boxes over data, as I did for fifteen don't, years, <laughs> don't feel don't feel bad. Nope, not at all. It is hard to get through that density of information. It is but for those who are interested. Uh, Fowler and I, our plan at NDC Oslo this year, our second talk is to do a talk like that. Where we take, you know, in other words, oh, let's let's write some middleware, and then we'll write like the, you know, the 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 very naive what you would just do the first time out, and then we go right, let's we'll measure it, and then we'll go through all the things and go right down the the wormhole about how far you can really go in optimizing something if you really care about getting out as much performance as possible. Cool. All right, I'm done with the links. Scott Hanselman, cool. you've got a. So you've got I have. So what's going on with me is that I am going to women who code. Uh, PDX, and I'm doing a three-hour learning to use Git workshop, along with my friend Grace Andrews from Puppet, and I have to start driving in 13 minutes. So okay. let's. Uh, Hunter showed up. He now pulled rank on everyone. He's I, I, I want to show one more, more link, John. Something important yeah. is going on. Can you just go to the ASP.NET site? Sure. Okay. I uh, will share my screen as soon as I'm there. Da, 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 da. Pressure's on. Oh yeah, I got this. Use Edge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to call out the link at the top, which is register for ASP.NET course uh, sessions presented by Scott Hunter, Jeff Fritz, and Dan Roth um, at Dev Intersections. So yeah, coming up soon. Three of us in uh, about a month are doing uh, an all-day training event uh, there in Orlando. So if you're in Orlando, please come see us. Um, and then I, th I guess we have one more, Scott. Is it in two weeks from tomorrow? Uh, you and I will be on stage at Build. Uh, yep. live streaming um, what's coming up next for .NET. We are going to have a bunch of great stuff. We're going to have an ASP.NET session. We're going to have a Languages session. We're going to have a .NET session. Uh, we'll see all of our friends. May have some our session. Have a SignalR session. We may have yeah, some guests. Ha may have some guest demoers nice. uh, jump on the stage and show some of the cool stuff that they're working on. So yeah, and, cool. And I'm leading a pre-conference <laughs> workshop on .NET Core. Uh, we've got Kendra and Glenn also co-presenting with that. Nice. Exciting and then stuff. in June, a few of us will be at NDC Oslo to do a two-day workshop on ASP.NET Core 2. Yep. And sh shouldn't talk about it yet. Nope. And, uh, and then we'll, obviously there'll be a few talks. I think John, you'll be here with in the mm -hmm. Fowler. And then a couple months after that, we'll be in Australia doing it again, except it'll be Barry Dorans and me teaching the workshop in Australia this year. So very cool. Yeah, it should be good fun. I was going to tell you all the secret stuff, but then Scott came, so I can't tell you. Uh, oh, we've just been when, working hard. And when you, uh, hey, Damien, <laughs> when you put your arm down hard, it makes a big thumping noise because you hit the oh, microphone. So I best not do that. Bad. Well, Thank or you. or just or painful. just use it use it for great effect. Use it for effect. Because Hunter does. You saying that immediately, the first thing Hunter does right, is do it. Exactly. <laughs> you gotta test it. You gotta test it. We have to validate what you guys say. That's so. right. That's right. Um, no, so we're all crazily um, getting ready for our first preview of 2.0. I mean, we've talked about 2.0 stuff for a while now. There's a lot of stuff coming. Razor Pages is looking sweet. It's looking really, really nice. I'm really happy where that's landing. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening under us in .NET Core 2, .NET Standard 2, which we've talked about a lot. Uh, we've done a lot to... There's been a lot of small tweaks in how .NET Core 2 as a development platform sort of comes together. We've worked a lot on the sort of the first run experience. So once you acquire, then you do your first .NET new. There's some things about that experience today that we're not particularly happy with, that we've made some improvements all through the stack to uh, to improve that. 
Um, there's been the great Kestrel replumbing that we've talked about a few times, where Kestrel has been replumbed on this new API called System IO Pipelines. Uh, that won't be public in 2.0. It'll be internal for Kestrel only, but we intend to make it public later in the year as part of a minor release on top of 2.0. Um, incidentally, it lines up with when Signaler will go public because Signaler relies on this API being public, so that's really cool. Um, and then there's just a lot of really small things throughout the ASP.NET Core layers <clears throat> that we're doing that I think are, are going to have a big impact. So one is, if you look at ASP.NET Core template today in Visual Studio, there's a lot of goop in program main and startup CS that we kind of decided was our, you talk about opinionated framework, Scott. Mm -hmm. We we kind of purposely weren't opinionated in many areas in 1.0. Like we, ha we did have some strong opinions, like we wanted DI to be a foundation of the stack. Um, we wanted everything to be code first, not configuration first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We probably over pivoted towards the code first because we show every single yeah. thing. And I think to be fair, I think that's the right foundation for the platform. What we hadn't done is then go to the next level and say, what can we put on top of that that we consider idiomatic that then becomes you know the, the simpler but is still based on top of that uh, foundation layer. Now we did that in the templates in 1.0. So there was a lot of code in the templates that was like set up configuration. This is the order the configuration flows from uh, you know config files, JSON files, and then the environment variables, and then user secrets, and then command line args. Um, similar for logging, we would configure console logging and debug logging uh, out of the box, uh, and then left it up to the developer to figure out what they wanted to do beyond that. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We have now codified all those defaults inside a new API called the Webhost API. So that in 2.0, file new will simply say webhost.create default builder, and inside create default builder, all that default has happened for you. So all the stuff around how should logging be configured and how should configuration be set up and do I have an app settings file and an app settings .production file and that type of stuff, we've just defaulted all that stuff. If you don't like what we've chosen as our opinionated default, you don't call that API, you call them the same way you did in 1x because it's layered on top of all the same stuff that was there before. Then on top of that, uh, particularly with configuration, that's we had my, no, I know one. Scott's very happy about this. We had no opinions about configuration in 1.0. Like we built a whole new configuration system and said, if you want to use it, have fun. And then the only way it was ever wired in was you passed it through manually, which we did in the templates, but it was just code. We've gone a little more opinionated in 2.0. There's now a default instance of configuration in the host uh, when you boot ASP.NET Core, when you boot that web host. You can configure that, obviously. You can use the API I just talked about, and we'll give you a default configuration that says, hey, build configuration from these JSON files, build it from the environment variables, build it from user secrets if you're in development, um, and then also allow passing in stuff from the command line. Um, and you can still customize that as you always have been able to, but there's a default instance now, and it's in DI. So that means that anything that's in DI by default, any server, which is everything, right? Everything is in DI in ASP.NET Core. Um, they can take an assumption, they can make an assumption that there is an I configuration in DI, and they can get stuff out of it. So that leads into a, a, something we call a convention-based configuration, where all of our subsystems eventually, they won't all have it in preview one, but we hope by RTM they will, all of the subsystems of ASP.NET Core 2, you know, identity, MVC, entity framework, uh, all the various middleware, authentication, uh, razor pages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Kestrel, they will all support a schema that is defined inside the configuration system uh, that's zero code. So if you say add Kestrel or you say mm -hmm. add entity framework, you can set that thing up declaratively just by having configuration in your JSON file. And one of the advantages of that is that a lot of that configuration can be changed while the app is running without it being rebooted. That's super great for things like logging. So you can tweet logging filters and logging providers without having to restart your app. We only supported that for the console logger in V1. We're now going to support that for all logging out of the box in V2, which is enormous, especially for cloud-based scenarios where you want to you know, have logging on all the time, but you want to be able to tweak it in real time without rebooting your app. So that's going to be really good. Um, it also just makes things more approachable. If you want to make something a configuration setting, you don't have to think about plumbing it all the way through the system now. You just change it in the app settings.json file that'll be in the template to start with, and then you can just consume it directly in your controller, iConfiguration, and it's there. And if you want to do the extra mapping of getting a strongly typed object, an options object that's bound to that, you can add that one line of code in your configure services, and that'll automatically get bound from configuration based on the schema layout. And then you've got the strong typing as well if you want that. I would assume this would mean that some of our tooling could be better as well, because right, yes. now, right now we have to go modify stuff in the CS file to mm -hmm. actually turn things on. Yep. I should be able to turn some of the authentication on right from tooling. I could right click and say, enable this, enable that, yeah. enable this. So that is so one of the side effects of this, kind of the fallout of this, is that. Code-based code configuration is great, except tooling code 
editing is practically impossible. impossible. Like it's really difficult to do. Like we all know about code fix-ups in Roslyn, which are fantastic, and they can identify certain patterns, and then you control dot in VS, and it changes your code for you. Doing that at a larger scale with things like our scaffolding system is a little error prone. And as soon as your code looks different to what we expect, we can't really change it anymore. But for things that are based on conventions that can be declarative and just a JSON file. Tooling can just now spit stuff into the JSON file, which is very easy. Well, to I can do. imagine Mavs having an extension that just lets you enable Google authentication. Yeah, possibly. Um, that in conjunction with another new feature, which is platform light up or hosting startup, as we're calling it, uh, you can now uh, add a class inside uh, your application and decorate it with an attribute, and we will find it automatically when your application starts uh, because it has this attribute. And then uh, we'll call a method on it. Uh, during hosting startup, so that you get a chance, that method gets a chance to change logging, uh, change configuration, inject services, which include a startup filter if you need to add a middleware in the beginning of the pipeline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so now tooling can again take advantage of that. If a lot of the times when you add something to an ASP.NET Core app, what you need to do is set up configuration, set up services, add something into the middleware pipeline, add some files into the project, da 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 da. What if you could just do all that automatically through a tooling gesture? because we can just lay files down without having to be scared of breaking other stuff in your app because we're editing files, and then they're just discovered as part of the startup process. So we're, we've added features that are enabling those type of things now. We may not get to leverage them all right out of the bat, but we've added a bunch of features that are related that we're going to build on over time that do so. We're also going to use a bunch of these features to enable some really nice scenarios in Azure, but we'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks, yes. Pause, pause for effect. Pause for effect. Thinking, cool. no questions. <laughs> it's good. Well, so um, we, we no, I just want to know as long as we can rename it to .NET on Nails, I'll be fine. I'll be happy. That on Nails. <laughs> we we had one question from Hisham. He was asking, can we do the same thing with localization to add supported cultures without a reboot of the app? Yeah, we absolutely could. So basically, any subsystem today that takes an options object, which is pretty much all of them. Uh, to configure how that subsystem works, whether it's a middleware or something services driven, it can be updated to support this now. And so as I said, I think what we'll do is over the, the pre-releases and the final release for 2.0, you'll see those subsystems kind of come in and uh, opt into using this new system. We won't get them all by default out of the box because it, you know, we have to go through and update each one to have whatever schema it likes. But that, yes, we can absolutely do that. And that's a great mm -hmm. suggestion. We should absolutely do that. All right, I have to go. Okay. And that's awkward, that's but uh, it is what it is because it's taken me an hour to drive down there. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. So thank you for the, I called this one the short one or the short version anyway. Um, and uh, I'm a little concerned that I look about 10 years older than my boss. Which well, is, you do have a very full beard. So. Well, we did and get compliments. Ben Adams complimented our beards when the, when the oh, show really? started. Yeah. So my kids, right now. My kids that, always go like this and they do this kind of like. <laughs> I keep mine short, Scott, so it doesn't have the gray like yours does. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, I told myself that, but then it just means that I've all got white stubble all over the place. But uh, I, I gotta, I need to get more wrinkles like uh, Pierce Brosnan so I can get that Remington steel thing, and then it's I'll a smile. Be... That's all it is. <laughs> okay. And like a, like a, like like a crazy person that just came down from the That's mountain. That's right. That's right. <laughs> what year is it? When I was a boy, we didn't have ones and zeros. <laughs> we only had zeros. All right, all right everybody. Let's extreme, do the dramatic extreme. zoom out. Mm -hmm. the boss. Zooming out, it's engaged. This is an important oh, part of the show. Oh, it's it's far as it goes. Oh, for God's sake. You screwed up the <laughs> dramatic zoom out. That's the Three shortest dramatic the zoom out you've ever Three done. You're supposed to zoom into the Iron Man part of your okay. shirt, and right. then we zoom I'll out zoom into the ones in the There we go. Zoom into nowhere, man. Look at that. Oh, OK, here we go. And then I'll zoom out. Look, dramatic. there we are. Zoom dramatic. It's so dramatic. Stop.